right, welcome to the August 17th, 2020 Board of Education meeting. Uh, at this time, I would like you all to stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, before we take a uh, roll, I would like to read our new vision statement. Uh, from last meeting. So our new vision statement is lead with respect, trust, and courage. Ensure an equitable, collaborative, and inclusive culture. Enable all to achieve success. Okay, first order of business. Phil, could you go ahead and take roll? Uh, President McFarland told us he would be absent. Vice President Singer? Here. Secretary Rauch is here. Treasurer Friedel? Here. Member Baker? Here. Member Blazy? Here. And Member Lauterbach is moving a kid into college, so. Okay, thank you, Bill. Five. Excellent. All right, moving into the consent agenda. Are there any mm -hmm. items that you want to remove from the consent agenda and discuss individually? We have items 2.1, approval of the meeting minutes. Item 2.2, a 2.1 was meeting minutes from uh, July 20th for the DEI workshop. 2.2 is meeting minutes for a regular meeting, July 20th. 2.3 is approval of the minutes from our August 3rd special meeting. And item 2.4 is teachers recommended for employment for the 2020-2021 school year. Item 2.5 is persons who have announced their resignation. Item 2.6 is approval of legal payments to Thrun Law Firm. Item 2.7 is approval of payments for the school system bills for the month of June. And that's it. I'd like 2.7 removed from the consent agenda, please. Okay. <clears throat> we will move item 2.7 to um, outside the consent agenda. We'll just keep it 2.7, but move it outside the consent Yep. Okay. Um, at this time, I'll entertain a motion to approve item 2.1 to 2.6. Make a motion to approve items 2.1 to 2.6. Do I have support? Support. Support by Lynn. A motion by Phil. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? <clears throat> and motion carries unanimously. We'll move into item 2.7, which was removed from the consent agenda. This is approval of the payment of the school system bills for the month of June 2020, as listed in the check register, prepared by Ms. Holderby, in the amount of $7,049,803. Uh, uh, the distribution of the obligation by uh, fund is included in the documentation. Uh, were there any questions on this? Wait, we'll make a motion first, right? Oh, you're right. Can I have? Oh, yeah, I'll make a motion to approve item 2.7. <clears throat> Moved by Phil. Do I have support? Support. Support by Lynn. Now we'll open it for discussion. Is there any discussion? Uh, for the purchase card transactions, uh, there is an item that is uh, Wallsworth P. I wonder if you can explain what that might be. Brian, are you there? I, I yeah, don't. I'm here. I would have to take some time to look up that individual transaction. Okay. But I, I don't have it right in front of me, Brad. Okay. Um, I had another question on Windstream. Is that Windstream wireless or a different type of Windstream that we have un under the, the larger PO system? 
I know that our technology department uses Windstream for a couple of different things. Um, I know Mr. Dietzik is um, listening, um, but I don't know in reference to what specific service is for that PO. That's something that I can look up for you as well too and provide, but do not have okay. it right in front of me. All right. Um, Fred, go ahead. For, uh, our, they maintain the fiber network, and we also have them for our phone service. Okay. And that's an open order for the year? Yes, yes it is. That's for both the fiber, they do uh, as needed repairs, and then the phone bill changes, it changes slightly every month. Okay. And then um, Petroleum Traders Corporation, obviously that's exactly what it is. I wondered if that an exact amount like that, if that, if we have a, a contract with them, is that something that we have, I know we've had discussion about this in the past, Mike, is that something that we kind of have an open agreement with them, or? You guys say it one more time, you broke up just a little bit on the name. I've got that one, Mike, if you're okay. Um, yeah, go right because I didn't hear the name. Sure, we do have a contract with them, Brad, um, and it is a January to January contract. And um, we extended that contract last January at the exact same terms that we had the previous January. So it's an open PO for filling our fuel um, with the specified rate, and we extended it last January. It'll come up again this January, and we intend to rebid it one more time when it comes to this winter. So it splits fiscally. A portion of it goes to last year's budget, and a portion goes to this year's budget because it's a January to January? No. Um, the expense that you see in that open PO would be just from July 1 forward. But the contract that we had specifies the terms that they charge us um, for the fuel delivery um, for the period of January to January. So we do not pay them expressly that amount you saw in the PO. That's the amount that the open PO is up to. And we would only be charged what our actual fuel deliveries are in that okay but we have a pretty solid history so it's going to be something in that neighborhood sure unless something out of the norm happens like last spring with athletic trips and things like that um, but yeah we we set it at a spot that we believe is reasonable to expect with our plane transportation routes and athletic transportation <clears throat> so it's a flexible amount that we only get charged for what we use so if we are down 2,000 students in face-to-face, -face, we're going to have, we still have the same bus routes, but I, I don't know if that gets changed at all with, with our busing. Um, no, the, ver the variable really in, in uh, fuel bread is price. It's like okay. you said, it's, you know, when, when you get done at each school year, we're very close in gallonage depending on trips we took and all that but the size of our district you know that, that doesn't change a lot but it's price you know you've seen it diesel fuel goes from anywhere from a buck 90 to four dollars a gallon and we've seen it that's the variable okay and so we're only charged for what our tank fills actually cost plus the negotiated contract rate on it and so the intention of having an open purchase order is so that we don't have to bring individual transactions um, when we have a contract that guides that piece. So that is not an obligation amount. That's simply an amount that's authorized up to um, for our period of time. And the reason you do that, Brad, is efficiency. So if we if it's $4 a gallon and we're dropping 10,000 gallons out there, then it would be above threshold. And we'd have to go out and get three quotes or bids every time. And so what you tend to do on these open POs is do that at the beginning of each year. And that's common in all districts. Okay. Okay, if there's no more questions, uh, we'll move into a vote. All in favor of item 2.7 approval approval of the payment of the school system bills for the month of June 2020 say aye. aye 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 all opposed and that passes unanimously uh, now I will turn over to Mr. Jaster to present student reinstatement hearing recommendations 
Thank you. Three separate student reinstatement hearings were held on Wednesday, August 12th. Present at the subcommittee hearings were three board members, Superintendent Shero, Associate Superintendent Jaster, school administrators, parents, and representatives of students A, B, and C. It's the recommendation of the board subcommittee that students A, B, or C would be either reinstated conditionally, unconditionally, or denied reinstatement at that time. This action that follows requires a roll call vote for the, of the board for each of the following students. In the matter of student A, the board subcommittee recommended unconditional reinstatement. In the matter of student B, conditional reinstatement. In the matter of student C, conditional reinstatement. Okay, very good, thank you. Um, so we'll take a motion for item 3.1 for action for student um, A. Make a motion to unconditionally reinstate student A. Support. Motion by Rausch, support by Baker. Is there any discussion? Uh, just note that Mary is still muted, so if we can take her off mute for the roll call. Okay. Mary, right. the dialogue box does pop up. Oh, they just got here for a second. There you go. Okay, Phil, could you go ahead and do a, a roll call for us? Yep. Vice President Singer? Yes. Secretary Rausch is yes. Treasurer Friedel? Yes. Member Baker? Yes. Member Blazy? Yes. That student A is uh, reinstated five to zero pin. Okay, thanks, Phil. Okay, so moving into item 3.2, I'll take a motion to approve item 3.2. Actually, uh, you mean, sorry, you mean oh. student B, right? Yeah, student B is yeah. for three points. So I'll, make, I'll make a motion to reinstate student B with conditions as outlined in the board pack. Oh, you're right, three, right. Support that. Motion by Phil, support by Mary. Is there yeah. any discussion so. for student B? Seeing none, we'll move into a roll call vote. Vice President Singer? Yes. Secretary Rausch? Yes. Treasurer Friedel? Yes. Member Baker? Yes. And Member Blazy? Yes. So that's five and zero, Pam, for conditional, re conditional reinstatement of student B. All right, then a motion for student C. Um, make a motion to reinstate student C with conditions as outlined in the board pack. Support. Moved by Phil, support by Mary. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, can we move into a roll call vote? Yep. Vice President Singer? Yes. Secretary Rausch is yes. Treasurer Friedel? Yes. Member Baker? Yes. Member Blazy? Yes. And that's five to zero for conditional appro reinstatement approval for student C. Okay, thanks, Phil. All right, we'll move into item 3.2, which is also for action, a return to school equipment orders. We're talking about air scrubbers to align with the Michigan Safe School return to school roadmap, MPS administration, is procure, procuring equipment to align with the required and recommended safety protocols. Uh, did anyone else, uh, Jeff, did you wanna, or Brian, did you wanna? Yeah, yeah Brian. I'll take this one, Pam, thank you. Um, both items 3.2 and 3.3 are a continuation of the conversation that we started last month with our processes in trying to get ourselves ready for the return to school plans that we have. And so item 3.2 is procuring air scrubbers, and these air scrubbers will be installed at all elementaries and all secondary buildings in our largest common areas. So in total, there'll be about 90 units that are gonna be installed. 
and we are recommending issuing a purchase order of $81,132.23 to Tomark Inc. of Saginaw, Michigan for air scrubbers to be installed as prescribed. Very good. Thanks, Brian. Yep. At this time, I'd entertain a motion for item 3.2. I move that we uh, approve uh, item 3.2, purchase uh, a purchase order for the air scrubbers. Support. Moved by Mary, support by Lynn. And is there any discussion? Who's gonna install these units? Tomark Inc. Tomark Inc. Okay. And I should so, have pointed out to Pam that these are going to be paid for by the CARES Act funds. I apologize for that. Oh, okay. CARES Act. Yeah. All right. And then these, uh, do, do the scrubbers go in near the, like, the cool air returns and then scrub the air and then push it back through? Or how does that work? Brian, you yeah. want me to take? Yeah, it goes, they go in front of the ducts since they'll be installed on there to clean. Okay. The air only circulates room to room. Oh, it's excellent. I'm One room so it, thrilled that we can do one this. One room in and out. So this will be in our large areas like our cafeterias and our gymnasiums. Yeah, that, yeah to do every individual classroom is probably out of reach, as you could tell, in number of classrooms. But we think those larger areas, that will assist us in that area where there's potential commingling out there. Commingling, right. Okay, very good. Are there any other questions for discussion? Seeing none, we'll move into a vote. All in favor of approving item 3.2, the purchase of the air scrubbers, say aye. 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 All opposed? And it passes unanimously. We'll move into item 3.3 for action, return to school equipment orders, hand sanitizing stations. and. Brian, already, do you talked about this a little bit? Yep, I'll continue just a little bit more. Um, this was one of the final pieces that we were working on for getting our return to school procurement orders in place. Um, we were lucky enough to be able to find them with the Midland Paper Company. And so we are recommending issuing a purchase order for $28,350 to the Midland Paper Company for 630 individual hand sanitizing stations and those will be installed in every single classroom within MPS, also our common and high traffic areas as well too. And this will also be procured using the CARES Act funds. Okay. At this time, I'll entertain a motion for item 3.3. .3. I make the motion to approve item 3.3, .3, um, the uh, purchase of the hand sanitizer stations um, that's gonna be paid for with the CARES Act funds. Support. Support. Moved by Mary, support by Phil. And is there any discussion? Seeing none, we'll move into a vote. All in favor of approving the purchase of the return to school equipment order of hand sanitizing stations, say aye. 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 All aye. opposed? And it passes unanimously. At this time, we'd like to open uh, open it up for anyone who would has requested to address the board. I believe we do have Dr. Thomas John Bender uh, that has a request. Welcome. Thomas, can you state um, your, your address and uh, your affiliation with Midland Public Schools as well? Uh, we can't hear you. So so we're unmuting. You give it gives a second behind the scene here, Pam. We have to unmute the speakers. We're going to have three tonight, and so after each one, if you want to turn to us, we'll give you a name. Okay, great. Uh, I'm sorry. You asked me to state what information? Yeah, your name, your address, and your affiliation with Midland Public Schools. Uh, yes. Uh, so my name is Thomas Bender. I'm speaking to you as a citizen of Midland and father of rising first grade student, my six year old son Russell. Uh, I live at uh, uh, Oak Ridge Drive in Midland. Great, thanks. So uh, I am also happen to be a CDC trained uh, MD, PhD epidemiologist, currently employed as the medical director of the Bay County Health Department. 
my views about reopening schools are informed by my professional expertise and hands-on experience responding to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. So let me just say, please do not open the schools for in-person learning at this time. It is not safe enough for the students. It is not safe enough for the teachers and staff, and it is not safe enough for you and other members of our community. Current conditions in Midland require that we limit schools to what has been the status quo since March 13, distance learning. It could be much safer to reconsider opening schools for in-person learning in two to three months when rapid testing could be widely available and when we'll have learned more about the experimental school reopenings already taking place elsewhere. Evidence from other countries indicates that a low baseline rate of community transmission is the most important factor for school reopening to be safe and successful. Although reopening schools will inevitably result in new cases, it will be possible for schools to remain open by limiting the increase in new cases through a combination of testing and contact tracing when the following conditions are met. Number one, the spread of the virus is reduced to less than one new case per 100,000 people per day. Number two, testing is readily accessible. And number three, test results are reported within 48 hours. Midland County is currently seeing a rate of 2.6 new cases per 100,000 people per day, which could well be an underestimate. Testing remains relatively scarce in Midland, currently offered at the hospital and two urgent care centers. Since August 1st, the time from specimen collection to test reporting exceeded 48 hours for 50% of confirmed cases of COVID-19 identified in Midland County, with delays extending as long as 10 days. These extended delays render testing all but useless and serve to perpetuate spread of the virus. I appreciate that Midland Public Schools has already invested a great deal of time and energy into preparing for reopening. Midland is in a region of the state that, according to the My Safe Schools Roadmap, continues to be classified as phase four, meaning that in-person instruction is permitted with required safety protocols. The roadmap describes phase four conditions as follows. Most new outbreaks are quickly identified, traced, and contained due to robust testing infrastructure and rapid contact tracing. Unfortunately, current conditions in Midland don't yet meet that description. Even though schools could be reopened, that doesn't mean schools should be reopened. When schools have reopened elsewhere, outbreaks have forced schools to shutter classrooms or entire schools shortly thereafter. You likely have seen accounts of what has happened at various schools across the South. Even though case rates are lower here in Midland, there is little reason to believe that things would go very differently. The board previously acknowledged that maintaining physical distancing within classrooms will not be possible and that enforcing a mask wearing mandate is likely to be difficult. If you open schools, the number of cases will grow rapidly, prompting schools to close again, perhaps within a month. If the opportunity for students to enjoy the benefits of normally, normally associated with in-person instruction is likely to be short-lived, then putting students and staff at risk of viral exposure and subjecting the community to amplified viral spread seems pointless at best. Distance learning can't replace a great in-person experience and it probably isn't the best thing for most kids academically or socially, I know that. But a few months or even a year of suboptimal distance learning is one thing. Sickness and death is another. Although plans for reopening middle and public schools to in-person instruction should be delayed, I would not ask and do not expect the board to guarantee absolute safety for students, staff, parents, or other community stakeholders who will be affected by the board's decisions. The good news is this. It should not be necessary to await the arrival of a vaccine. Rather, reopening schools would be reasonable when community transmission is reduced and rapid testing is more readily available. The availability of testing multiple times each week to all players and staff has allowed Major League Baseball to continue their season outside of any bubble because cases and outbreaks affecting certain clubs have been controlled. Likewise, widespread availability and frequent use of rapid at-home tests should be transformative for the general public, restoring the ability to resume activities, including in-person classes. Unlike a vaccine, such tests might be available later this fall. I'm grateful for you the opportunity to share my views with the board and I'm happy to answer any questions either now or later in writing. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. We'll uh, take your comments um, into advisement. 
uh, this is um, an opportunity where we we have the community able to talk to us, but uh, then we, we take that information and can disseminate it after the fact. And if we have questions, we can get a hold of you. Appreciate you coming out and talking to us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Pay me a second. Speaker is Katrina Robel, and hopefully I pronounced that Katrina right. Great. Katrina, could you... Um, also state your address unless you're not if if anyone isn't comfortable stating their address they can uh, um, get that to us on the side uh, but a way to get a hold of you um, as well and then how you're affiliated with Midland Public Schools yeah um, so Katrina Robo my address is 5709 Drake Street I'm coming to the board today as the parent of two children who will be staying home this semester um, because I take this pandemic very seriously and I also acknowledge that being able to choose this option is a privilege. Um, virtual learning is the best choice for my family, but for many in our district, being able to attend school in person is critical. This may be the case for many reasons, but the reason weighing on my heart today is the safety and well-being of children. Specifically, I'm referring to the children who are returning to school in person after having spent months without safety and security because school is their only safe space. I was one of these children who relied on school to be a place without physical or emotional abuse. I remember counting the days until school started because I knew teachers would report something if they saw the bruises. These are the children I want you to think about today. <clears throat> For these children, the uncertain risks of COVID are likely lesser than the certain dangers they are currently facing day to day. That's a tough pill to swallow because we know COVID is dangerous. At the same time, we also know the spaces children are in when they aren't in school are dangerous. As a mask wearing, hand washing, physically distancing parent, I'm advocating for children who face certain risks of abuse if they're not in a classroom or building where teachers and support staff can see them regularly. Just this week, we saw the Midland Daily News share information on an increase in domestic violence calls. While this gives us a little insight into home life for children, an even more striking reality is that since the start of the stay at home orders across this country, the National Sexual Assault, Assault Hotline realized that for the first time ever, Half of hotline calls were made by children under the age of 18. The calls made by children rose 22%. And of those callers, 79% said they were living with their abuser. The confirmed risk of physical, sexual, and emo emotional abuse to children in these households is greater than the possible risks of COVID. I'm asking the board to take courageous and innovative steps to be proactive and partner with local agencies and develop new ways to keep children safe if and when we need to take breaks from in-person learning due to COVID. Let's think beyond the argument of school is not a daycare and remember that school is, for many children, the only place they are safe. Even with the constant threat of COVID, the risk of harm can still be greater at home for many. I'm certain teachers and staff live this reality and know it too well. But as a community, we must think boldly and recognize we are stronger together. MPS does not have to shoulder this burden alone. I ask the board to partner with local agencies and nonprofits to create safe spaces children can go to when our schools inevitably close due to COVID, like so many other districts across the country are already facing. Reach out to the many foundations and explore the existing funding options. Let's find a way to have crisis drop-in centers where gyms, large spaces, and even outdoor areas become supervised virtual learning time for children with no place else to go. Let's utilize paraprofessionals to staff these places. Otherwise, our paras will once again face unemployment. Connect with the professionals in this space and be champions for the safety and well-being of children who have no other safe options besides relying on MPS to provide a safe haven. We can do better. And the children in our district are relying on us to do better. So let's connect with the professionals in this space and build meaningful partnerships to make our community safer 
and let our children thrive. Thank you, Katrina. We appreciate you uh, coming to the board tonight and sharing your thoughts, and we'll take those into advisement. So thank you again. Pam, our third speaker is Michelle Waskovich. Very good. Michelle, could you introduce yourself, your address, and how you're affiliated with Midland Public Schools? Uh, my name is Michelle Waskovich. Um, I'm affiliated, um, <laughs> I'm actually representing um, myself as an executive director of a nonprofit in Midland County. Um, I did have three children go through Midland Public, but they are um, beyond those years now. So, um, as I stated, I'm the executive director of Safe and Sound Child Advocacy Center here in Midland. Our mission is to prevent child abuse and neglect, um, and we do this through both prevention and intervention services. Um, I would like to speak with you today about the COVID-19 response and the impact it's had on children. We are all aware on March 23rd, Governor Whitmer signed the stay home, stay safe executive order in response to the pandemic. Businesses were directed to, spend, to suspend all non-essential services. Michiganders were asked to stay in their homes. Schools were closed and children were no longer able to participate in groups and sports. This was all done for one simple reason, to keep individuals safe. Unfortunately, what we didn't foresee was the length at which we would be under these orders and how these orders would actually put some children into unsafe situations, especially for those already living in high risk environments. As Katrina stated just a moment ago, Children are making more calls for help to the National Sexual Hotline. And they're reporting the abuser is not only a family member, but also someone that they're living with. These children are our children, our community's children. These children are Midland Public Schools children. Schools are a major safety net for children when it comes to reporting signs of abuse. Since their closing, many children have become invisible to the, to the professionals that have the ability to report concerns. According to the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, the number of reports to Child Protective Services fell by 40% when comparing the first two weeks of March 2020 to the second two weeks of March 2020. As children return back to school this fall, I believe we have a responsibility. Now more than ever, teachers, paraprofessionals, administrators, and anyone else who has contact with children in the schools need to be vigilant. We need to keep our ears and eyes open to what children are saying and what they're not saying. I believe we have a responsibility to educate ourselves about the signs of abuse, how to respond, and how to appropriately report these concerns. Safe and Sound offers a two-hour evidence-based training on just this topic. I want to encourage you as school board members to consider making this a priority for the staff of Midland Public Schools. We will work with you, school buildings, administration, and any individuals to make it as easy as possible. It is a free training. I would love to discuss this with you in further detail on how we can make it happen. I lead with these words by the World Health Organization Director General. There is never an excuse for violence against children. We have evidence-based tools to prevent it, which we urge all to implement. Protecting the health and well-being of children is central to protecting our collective health and well-being now and for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Appreciate you coming out and sharing your thoughts with us, and we'll take them into an advisement. Thank you. Pam, I don't believe we have any others, so. Okay, very good. Okay, we will move into, let me see where I am. Item four, or excuse me, item five. Item 5, 5, which is finance, facilities, and operations. We have 5.1, which is our study committee minutes. Uh, Ms. Friedel, do you have the minutes? I do. I do. Um, 
we went over June financials uh, submitted uh, at uh, the, that would be submitted, were submitted to the board tonight. Uh, final information was not available for FFO due to the need uh, for revenue information from the August state aid note and ongoing audit. Um, we had a state budget update, the status of the fiscal year 2021 uh, budget were reviewed. Um, we went over return to school plan emergency equipment orders, which we have approved. We uh, looked at the dam failure class action, um, talked about securing legal representation to reclaim fiscal losses um, that was discussed. We had a bond construction update. Uh, the representative from Barton Mallow provided a progress update on the summer construction projects. Um, we had diversity, equity, and inclusion. Dr. Amy Beasley and the FFO members discussed topic emergence, um, which would be appropriate for this committee. Our next meeting is Tuesday, September 8th at 5 o'clock. Thank you, Mary. Item 5.2 is also for information uh, on gifts totaling $3,406. Um, Brian, did you want to? Talk about those. Yes, ma'am. I'll take that. Um, three gifts to acknowledge tonight, as you said, for three thousand four hundred six dollars. First, we'd like to thank First um, for helping the Northeast Robotics team out um, for a three hundred six dollar grant. Um, number two, SK Communications was generous enough to gift us six hundred dollars for hotspot credit, and then also a unique gift from the Carlson Muir Family Foundation who gifted us $2,500 to help assist with the flood damages over at HHL High School. We certainly appreciate all three groups' generosity. And if okay with you, I'll move on to 5.3. That'd be great. Um, item 5.3, we'd like to extend a very special thank you to the Islamic Center of Midland for their donation of the text, The Proudest Blue, um, for our elementary media centers and classrooms that very much help enhance our DEI initiatives. Great. Thank you. Thank Ms. you, Senator, Brian. Okay. Um, Mr. Blazy asked a question earlier in the meeting about um, a purchase card purchase, and I was able to confer with our business office, Mr. Blazy, and that is a down a down payment on the 2021 Midland High Yearbook with the source from the Midland High Yearbook Club account. Okay. So it's a set fund that that's coming from? That is correct, sir. They have their own account that is funded purely by revenues from fees for the yearbook. And this is um, a standing down payment and we've traced it back to the same down payment for three years back now. Okay. Practice. Yes, sir. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Okay, we'll move into item 6.1 for human resources. We have staff members announcing their retirement. Uh, Mr. Jaster. Thank you. The following eight staff members have announced the retirement. The effective dates are also listed here in the chart. First is Denise Bajalski, teacher at Northeast Middle School. Her retirement was effective June 12th. Lori Dasher, paraprofessional at Woodcrest Elementary. Her retirement was effective June 11th. Lisa Ernest, teacher at Northeast Middle School. Retirement effective June 12th. Kevin Gosson, director of special services. His uh, retirement date will be effective September 30th. Norman Retzloff, building manager at Midland High School, effective retirement date September 7th. Kay Rogers, teacher, Midland High School, retirement date June 12th. Patricia Steele, teacher, Dow High School, also June 12th. And then last, Shelly Wickstrom, teacher at Midland High School, retirement date June 12th. Okay, thank you for the, those updates. Uh, we'll move into uh, item seven, which is correspondence to and from the Board of Education. We have 7.1, which is for information, uh, Midland Area Community Foundation, First and Chestnut Hill Elementary, uh, thank you, uh, notes, letters. Item 7.2 is also for information, uh, letters to the Board of Education. We had a FOIA request from Smart Pro Procure. Um, and we had a FOIA request from the Mackinac Center. 
Item 8, we have scheduled activities for information. 8.1 will list out uh, our remainder meetings scheduled for the end of the year and tentative dates um, approved till January 11th for organizational meetings. Uh, which moves us right on to item nine, which is study session discussion. This is when uh, we can hear from uh, board members or the superintendent. Um, do any board members have anything that they would like to share before we move on to superintendent uh, update? Mike? Seeing none, we'll go right to you, Mike. And I'm going to keep it short. Um, and I'm going to do so so maybe <clears throat> our hardworking staff can actually get home on a reasonable time this evening. We've um, just wanted to kind of go through a little bit what's been going on behind the scene and prepare for the school year. Um, you know, we, we basically are recreating delivery of instruction, uh, maybe more so than any time in history. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, I kind of talked to our staff about this just a little bit, that um, we tend to try to overdo here in MPS, and so we try to overachieve, right? And so some of the districts throughout the state chose simply one way or the other, and we chose to give our parents options, which uh, on uh, the board's behalf is a lot of work on our half. And so I've watched staff work six, seven, eight, eight days a week, I swear, um, 12, 14-hour days to do so. Um, just the internal staff here, at the administration center, I know I, I, you know, even on Sundays we're still working and talking back and forth to prepare for the school year. So I say stay patient. The virtual school and the schedules will get there. The schedules would usually are out in the students' hands by now, but we are going to take our time and do that right. We're going to have them out, you know, the week, the few days before school goes. Um, but we are creating a whole new delivery on that. On top of that, hopefully you see the work that we put in in trying to prepare our buildings for the, the opening of the school year and keeping it as safe as can be. Your building administrators and managers from behind the scene, you know, from painting lines and playgrounds to dividing traffic in their hallways to deciding how lunches are going to be served and done differently has changed as well. And our teaching staff now um, coming on board um, 40 to 50 of them will now be teaching virtually and being retrained to do that uh, along the way. And the others are going to be um, putting extra time in to help us manage students in the hallway, off buses, on into the school building, and probably eat their lunches with, with the students on many of them. So it's been a busy time behind the scene. Um, a little bit about where we are as far as enrollment. Our enrollment actually seems somewhat stable by what we polled today. We know there are some. It seems to be a small number that have homeschooled, so our options have worked pretty well. Um, we have about a 35% um, enrollment in the virtual or the hybrid model. So um, still a significant amount face-to-face. Our classroom numbers will be lower. The secondary is a little harder to figure until schedules are done. And the elementary we range from classrooms of 20 to as low as to 15. So that should help us with our social distancing as well as all the safety protocols we've put in place. Um, on Sunday, Saturday, Sunday, you, I've sent you some notices. Our legislators were busy. Today our governor signed into the bill that has some flexibility for people accounting, which will assist us significantly at Midland Public. But I also want the board to know this, this bill was very cumbersome. And it wasn't cumbersome just for all of us who work for you, but it will be for you as well. There's lots of reporting requirements in there that I think is oversight, way, way overreach from Lansing. And I think we need to remind our legislators of that when they come. And they, they give us help in one hand, but they really hindered us in a lot of other hands in, in the reporting. And so our board meetings coming forward may look a little different because of the reporting requirements that we're going to have to do. And um, we're going to need significant amount of hours to prepare these reports that have to be done every month. They really, I don't believe, needed to be there, be there along with the package. So as we get ready to open to, um, another school year, I usually kind of uh, remind staff about how excited we all are. Um, and myself, I'm getting into up to those years of 36, 37 years in this business, and I've seen a lot of them. And this one, I think we're, we have more anxiety than excitement. We certainly need to remind excitement, and we need to stay 
uh, positive and push forward. Um, we need to do that. I think a couple of our speakers tonight said that very well. We need to do that for our students um, going forward. But it is difficult on all the adults behind the scene as well as we enter in a different environment. So well-being will be a big piece of what we do going forward along with the academics. So um, we're less than two weeks away, and we'll see what the new year will bring here very soon. Excellent. Thank you. And a big thank you uh, to your staff and all those that are putting in so many hours. Um, this is, it's hard work and, and we, we uh, as a board and as a community, just really appreciate um, the options that you're allowing for parents in this community to take. And, um, and I think we're all grateful for that. Uh, at this point, I would like to uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. So Take moved. a motion to support. <laughs> moved by Mary, support by Phil. Uh, any discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, and we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>